Bible Treasures Topic 6 Fellowship Welcome to the Sound Doctrine Telecast. Praise God for all the corrective teaching we receive through this series of talks. The subject that we are considering during the last eight weeks has been Christian Fellowship. Beloved, the indispensability of fellowshipping with one another in the body of Christ has been repeatedly stressed during these talks. Because, beloved, our very fellowship with God depends upon our fellowship with men. Take, for example, 1 John 4th chapter, we'll read to you the 12th verse. No one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us. See how the relationship with God depends upon our relationship with one another. Hence the importance of this subject. Our topic that we are considering is how not to fellowship. So far, we have done eight lessons. Lesson number one. Do not disregard the indispensability of fellowship. Lesson number two. Do not be overruled by self-interest. Lesson number three. Do not be hypocritical in love. Lesson number four. Do not postpone reconciliation. Lesson number five. Do not be partial. And lesson number six. Do not write off anyone quickly. Lesson number seven. Do not give place to envy. Last week we studied lesson number eight. Do not expect too much from others. Today we will move on to lesson number 9. How not to fellowship. Do not lose the spirit of friendship. Once again, how not to fellowship. Do not lose the spirit of friendship. You know what is normally said in Christian circles? Friendship can be with anyone, but fellowship is with God's people only. But this does not mean, beloved, because we say so, that we must forsake the spirit of friendship when we move into the fellowship of God's people. But it is very unfortunate we lose the freedom and jubilance of friendship the moment we walk into the company of God's people. But the Bible has so much to talk about the necessity of the spirit of friendship in our fellowships with God's people. In the family of God or in the company of God's people, when we meet one another, When we refer to one another, we say brother and sister, isn't it? Which means we belong to the same family. Unfortunately, we don't even operate at the level of friendship. But the Bible wants us to add friendship into fellowship. Turn with us to 2 Peter 1st chapter. I look at the 7th verse. And to brotherly kindness, love. Brotherly kindness, that is in fellowship among brothers and sisters. And now it says, to that brotherly kindness and fellowship, add love. That is, friendship. Well, the early church had really understood this truth, and they had this understanding and celebration of this beautiful combination. Turn with us to the second chapter to meet the people of God immediately after Pentecost. Read verses 46 and 47. Continuing daily with one accord in the temple. That was fellowship. 
They did not stop there. They were breaking bread from house to house. To fellowship, they are adding this expression of friendship. And what was the result? They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They praised God, that was worship. Then it says they were having favor with all the people. So they maintained their spirit of friendship. Beloved, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Unfortunately, we are not even friends of saints. See the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ with his disciples. Turn with us to John's Gospel, 15th chapter. Read the 15th verse to you. No longer do I call you servants, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, because all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Because Jesus says, I am so open with you and transparent with you and close with you. You are my friends and I am your friend. Another passage which speaks about the same truth is Luke's Gospel 12th chapter. Read the fourth words to you. He says, I say to you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who kill your body. In other words, he says, you are my friends. And you know what is in there? A spirit of encouragement. Well, our Jesus himself calls us friends. How about us? Can it be any difference? He even called his betrayer Judas as my friend. Well, our this truth runs throughout the scriptures. Take, for example, Job and his friends. You read the entire book of Job, you don't read about any prayer meetings and no reference to any worship services. But in the entire book, there is a deep expression of friendship. Now, the same thing is true concerning the psalmist also. Turn with us to Psalm 119. Look at the 63rd words. I am a companion for all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. In other words, he says, those who fear God are God's people and that is the fellowship of God's people and he says, I am a friend to all those who fear God. The same spirit Daniel and his friends manifested with one another. Turn with us to the book of Daniel, second chapter. We'll read verses 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who were his companions, who were his friends. And they wanted to pray together. So here, in the fellowship of prayer, there was an expression of friendship. Turn with us to the book of 3 John and read verses 13 and 14. I had many things to write, but I don't want to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly and we shall speak face to face. You know, that's what friends desire, isn't it? And then he says, Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. How personal they are just writing their letters. And when you read through Paul's epistles, there was always some personalness in his greetings. Take, for example, the concluding chapter of Book of Romans, even Romans 16th chapter. In that 16th chapter, 17 times he uses the word greet, greet, greet. And then when he comes to the 16th words of that chapter, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. 
How can we express that friendship today? Not just a handshake, but a warm handshake. And a broad smile. And a friendly look. And an affectionate hug. And a holy kiss. And a loving inquiry. And a hearty word of blessings. Now turn with me to the book of Ruth. There is something very interesting. The second chapter. We'll read the fourth verse to you. Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. How oh, refreshing. And in the morning he comes to the field and all the field workers are ready for harvest. He says, The Lord be with you. And all the workers turn back and they tell him, The Lord bless you. Beloved, this is the refreshing nature of friendship. Now when you talk about friendship, you should not think that is only earthly in nature. Friendship is a divine, heavenly character. How do I say that? Turn with us to the book of James and look at the second chapter. There we have a reference to Abraham. The Bible says, Abraham was called the friend of God. Beloved, isn't it very interesting that God himself calls somebody his friend? In book of Exodus 33rd chapter 11th verse, we find that God speaks to Moses as a friend face to face. And when you come to the New Testament, Jesus Christ had friendship which was expressed even in his conversation with people. And others were able to quickly recognize that. Turn with us for an example in John's Gospel, 3rd chapter. Verse 29. Here we meet John the Baptist. What does he say? He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. You know, John and Jesus were relatives. But here, they go one step still further. John the Baptist says that I am the best man for Jesus Christ. And he says, by hearing his voice, my joy is fulfilled. And the same thing we read in John's Gospel, 11th chapter. Look at the 11th verse. These things Jesus said, and afterwards he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. Let us go that I may wake him up. So he says, Lazarus is our friend. You know, we are giving you so many examples that friendship is an integral part and the indispensable aspect of fellowship. At this point of time, we want to make a reference to the Lord's Supper. The main purpose of the Lord's Supper is to express this friendship among God's people. We want you to recollect that Acts of the Apostles, second chapter, 46 and 47, which we read out to you. They were breaking bread from house to house. That is why it was called Love Feast. Read Jude, 12th verse, where it is referred to as Love Feast. The Love Feasts were nothing but fellowship meals in which the Lord's Supper was remembered. That is what is implied in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter. Look at the 21st words. Here Apostle Paul is rebuking them for their wrong practice. In eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry and another is drunk. In other words, they were bringing meals from each family. And they were supposed to eat it as a love feast. 
But what did they do? Rich people who were hungry, they ate before even poor people arrived. This was the meaning of the Lord's Supper. But we have made it a ceremonial affair. We have made it a ceremonial thing and lost the entire meaning of the Lord's Supper. Whenever there is a communion service, 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, verses 23 to 32 will be often read. And there we make a stress on that verse 27, anyone who eats this bread or drink this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So what is the unworthy participation? That you should find out in the verses which come before this passage and the verses which follow that passage. From verses 20 to 22, what do we read? Eating before others come. In verses 34, where the apostle concludes this argument, he says, wait for one another. In other words, you know what is unworthy participation in the Lord's Supper? If there is no friendship in that fellowship, it is unworthy participation. It is not a ceremonial thing, but it is a fellowship thing. It is a friendship matter. That is why we always say that friendship and fellowship among God's people should go together. That is why it is called communion service. It is not taking communion, but it is partaking in communion. You say you take communion, that is Roman Catholicism. But when you say you are partaking in communion, you are expressing the friendship with one another. That is why foot washing is connected to this Lord's Supper. Read that in John's Gospel, 13th chapter. Jesus Christ washed the disciples' feet and then he went on to break bread and gave that drink. Now, why do we say foot washing is an expression of this friendship? That was an expression of hospitality in the olden times. When Jesus came to Simon's house, he said, I came into your house, you never gave me water to my feet. And we know Abraham, how he said, when he saw the three strangers, I will quickly go and run and bring some water to your feet. We want you to, beloved, to restore this spirit of friendship into all the activities of our fellowship. In the name of reverence, don't become very serious and long-faced. Be friendly with people in the fellowship of God's people. Read the book of Proverbs as many times as possible. As much as you read the book of Proverbs, you will understand the various ingredients of friendship that we should develop in the fellowship of God's people. Never ever think that the moment we move into fellowship, friendship should be set aside. How not to fellowship? Do not lose the spirit of friendship. As you restore the spirit of friendship in your fellowships, you will find the new dimensions of your fellowship life in the body of Christ. God bless you.